Hi, my name is Daniel Blackburn and today we're going to talk about soil potassium, its biogeochemical cycle and availability to crops. All right, this is another lecture, part of the course SWAE4401, Water and Nutrient Cycling in Soil Plant Environment. So again, today we're going to talk about soil potassium. We already uh, taught you how to measure plant available potassium from soils. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the background, what is about potassium in plant tissues in soils and what condition its bioavailability to plants and what is the strategy for a fertilizer application. All right. So, um, Potassium is uh, group one on the periodic table, just below sodium. And uh, one of the characteristics of potassium chemically is that it forms very soluble salts. Yeah, all the most soluble salts are between uh, uh, anions and sodium or potassium ions. And uh, it's, this is not different from what we find in soils. Uh, you will find that potassium and sodium are the go-to counter ions for soluble salts in soil, whereas other, uh, other bases like calcium and magnesium usually form precipitated uh, um, compounds in soil, depending on the pH, obviously. But potassium is a very soluble element in soils and therefore it's always uh, uh, moving around and interacting with different anions and with the clay surfaces, the colloid surfaces on the soils. So potassium in plants does not differ. We have the potassium is usually very high in concentration in plant tissues. Uh, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that uh, in the case of potassium, the plant concentration of this element is very variable. You can have that uh, if you have deficiency, you have a low concentration of potassium. And when you have excess potassium on the soil, the plants will over accumulate this. So you might have the potassium is very, very um, abundant in plant tissues. And it, this doesn't mean that it is the, the main nutrient or the one with the main roles in the plant, but it does have very important roles. Yeah? One of the things that we have considered in, from potassium in plants is that potassium usually not ever uh, is part of any molecules in, in, in plants. You know, it does not, it's not structural to any plant molecules. Potassium inside the plant tissues, as it is in the soil, uh, it's always in the ionic form. So it, all its roles, uh, it's regarding the, its presence in ionic form. So it, the open uh, enclosure of stomata are regulated heavily by potassium or, and therefore photosynthesis, gas exchange, uh, uh, water used by the plant, um, uh, uh, new tissue growth, this is all dependent on potassium, potassium because of its role as uh, in, the, in its ionic form. It, it's a counter ion for most anions, organic anions that the plant produces, so, such as citric, citric acid, oxalic acid, and etc. Potassium together with calcium inside the plant tissue, they are the counter ions that equilibrate these anions. Potassium is also very important in enzyme activation um, and the transport of sugars. And in some climates, cold climates, potassium is very important for the resistance to cold. So potassium fertilizer application is very important for plant physiology. Uh, if you don't have sufficiency of potassium, you will have serious problem with the water use, usage, photosynthesis, uh, uh, the the uh, the enzymes will be less active, you know, uh, in the cells. There's a big role of in, uh, of potassium on conditioning that ionic strength needed for some enzymes to be on the proper folding to perform its catalysis inside the plant tissues. Um, and uh, in general, you can say that potassium is 
uh, always regulating this homeostasis in the plant tissues, this equilibrium of ions uh, inside the plant tissues. When you don't have potassium, you will always uh, identify this clearly by uh, uh, intravenial chlorosis. Yeah, if you, the yellowing, but the stripy yellow features that you have the, the, uh, in, the, in the leaves. And also because of less growth of the plants also. You're going to be, have a lot less growth with, uh, with potassium, but this striping intervenium chlorosis is what you will see very often as a potassium deficiency. Here again in, in tomatoes, how it looks like, uh, comparing to what you see from phosphorus. Phosphorus, there's no yellowing at all. Nitrogen is only yellowing, but potassium has these patterns uh, uh, in the leaves that you can see. Here uh, in lettuce, you can see a little bit of burning also uh, uh, on the, the external sides of the leaves with, with less potassium. Um, for beans also, this is what I was referring to, this kind of uh, patchy patterns that you see on leaves. This is very characteristic for potassium, yeah? very characteristic for potassium. And because plants need potassium in high amounts, usually when you see this pattern, it's uh, a good indication that you might have potassium, potassium deficiency. So uh, for the biogeochemical cycle, we, we have to um, keep in mind that in this perspective, not, not in all perspectives, but in this perspective, it's the potassium cycle. It's more similar to what the phosphorus cycle is. You, you will have that the, the potassium cycle has very little to do with atmosphere. Uh, uh, you can have some dust containing potassium, but mostly, the, 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 the potassium is moving through the earth systems to the water and then by geological uplifting you will have this formation of, of the feldspars and potassium rocks also. But uh, uh, the, the K cycle is, is, uh, 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 very, uh, does not cycle through the atmosphere. Uh, it's uh, the, the decomposition of the rocks is the main source for the soil environments. From the soil, this potassium is lost to waters, and then again going through the, 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 the biogeochemical cycle of terrestrial systems through the weathering of these rocks. If you focus a little bit more in the soil environment, you will have that the, the, the main, in natural ecosystems, the main source of potassium is the weathering of rocks. Uh, usually feldspars are very rich in potassium uh, and if you have this, uh, feldspars as parent materials you will have high potassium soils. Um, otherwise uh, uh, um, the, the, the mineral fertilizers are the main source of potassium for most soils. If you don't have potassium rich parent materials then mineral fertilizers have to be the main source of this uh, element for crops. You have that uh, in, in, in soils, there are not many transformations. You will not find organic potassium or uh, precipitated potassium in different ways. Potassium can absorb, but its absorption is not so strong also. What happens is there is some interaction uh, between potassium and 2 to 1 clays, but that's not, uh, not heavily uh, about surface absorption, but it's more like the, the potassium can sneak in the, the layers of these clays. Yeah? And you lose potassium from the crop, from these uh, soils, uh, mainly by leaching and runoff and erosion. Also, you can lose a lot of potassium from the soil by crop exports, because the plants have this ability of over-accumulating potassium. And if you have a, a, a high potassium on the soil, the plants will take more potassium than they need in the plant tissue. Okay, so this is what I was talking about before. This is showing this ability of potassium to sneak in the, the, the interlayer of different clays like Montmorillonite, for example, all two to one clays, and you will have the potassium will be uh, being able to uh, uh, get inside this, this, uh, these layers of the, uh, the sheets of the clays and uh, by doing that, it, it will become unavailable for plants. And this behavior is highly dependent on the weather uh, in, uh, and uh, how moist the soil is and the, the seasonality of these uh, 
uh, um, this uh, fixation of potassium is very heavy. You know? The seasonality of this fixation is very heavy. So the ones that are in the surface of the clay outside can be exchanged. Uh, this is, uh, but the ones that are inside the clay particles, they are not immediately available to plants and the, the release is very slow. Mm -hmm. So the, there is some fixation of potassium, but its mechanism is very different from what the, what the fixation of phosphorus is. Yeah? Fixation of phosphorus is mainly adsorption, precipitation, and immobilization in organic molecules, whereas potassium is always associated with this two-to-one clays and this uh, ability of the potassium to be locked inside this, the sheets and layers of this two to one clays. Uh, so this fixation, as I was telling, is highly dependent on the wetting and drying of the soils. So uh, when you have that the soils become very dry, you will tend to have some more fixation of this potassium. Okay. Uh, it happens also when you don't have uh, uh, this two to one clay is you lose the ability of the soils to retain the potassium and usually these soils mm -hmm. will become very poor in potassium because of the potassium leaching yeah? because potassium is so soluble when you have this two to one clays you immobilize them in unavailable forms but in a sense you are also able to storage store some of this potassium for the next cycles yeah um, all right So uh, um, the net effect depends on whether uh, uh, you are in the cycle of drying or uh, wetting, depending on the seasonality. And this is uh, which one is dominating depends on the season of the year. And so you might have a strong variation of the, the soil test potassium throughout the year during, due to the wetting and drying of these soils. Uh, you, you always think about the soil test potassium, you have to think about trying to do it in the same time of the year and in the same weather conditions. Are you doing after a, a, a rain event or are you doing in a dry spell? So you have to think about when you do the soil sample, sampling for potassium, you have to think about the soil moisture to try to keep this a little bit more uniform, yeah? to keep it uniform and less varying throughout the seasons. So you have different extractants for potassium, but these are always weak extractions. Uh, calcium chloride could be, um, and uh, there are many others. So the one that we use for our practical was calcium chloride, but actually uh, potassium is fairly soluble. The, the available potassium is fairly soluble. In even water extracts, you will extract most of the plant available potassium. Um, and um, okay, so, the variation, the seasonal variation of potassium is uh, very strong, and here is showing um, this this uh, how it's it's happening. So you can see here that between 80 and 140, this is a very strong variation, almost a hundred percent change, um, and uh, this is why you cannot trust too much the soil test potassium as a, a, a way of fertilizer recommendation. So it gives you a hint of if your potassium is in a sufficiency level or let's say if you measure 20, 30, 10 ppms, you for sure you have a, 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 a potassium deficiency. But if you measure 90, 100, you might have deficiency or sufficiency. You, you, for being on the safe side, you should be uh, applying potassium when you measure on the low side of the bioavailable range okay um, all right so how to interpret potassium results if you have uh, something uh, over uh, 100 ppms in general you consider that you have sufficiency uh, between uh, 100 and up to 160 70 180 this is usually what you consider a sufficiency uh, level. If you have over 100, 180, usually is uh, excessive. Yeah, you, usually is excessive. Yeah, you will. You might find uh, loads of tables uh, recommending this for different crops. Uh, 
but actually because the soil test is not very accurate uh, I would recommend not sticking too much to this type of tables and uh, uh, ideally if you can repeat your test a couple of times and then you will have a rough idea where your potassium level are if it's between uh, 100 180 you are in the in the good position if you are be beyond that beyond 180 to 100 you might be willing to deplete soil potassium levels to safer ranges and uh, uh, if you are in, in insufficient levels below 100 ppm then you might want to apply uh, potassium fertilizer to your crops yeah and potassium fertilizer comes in different uh, salts and the main ones are uh, a potassium uh, muriate of pot uh, potash which is uh, potassium chloride um, potassium magnesium sulfate also potassium nitrate uh, potassium sulfate and potassium phosphate is not listed here but is also a commonly used fertilizer and it's integral part of the NPK formulas uh, uh, consider that when you have sufficiency of potassium you should choose the NPK formulas that uh, con do not contain potassium or contain a very low amount of potassium and when you have deficiency you should choose the ones which are very high in potassium of course what I really recommend is that you to base your fertilizer recommendation on the phosphorus and the nitrogen and uh, whatever you add together with the phosphorus and nitrogen of potassium usually you don't have to worry about potassium too much if you're adding it as soluble fertilizer you will have it enough for the crops but you should be, be um, uh, wary about the uh, excess of potassium in the soils usually uh, okay this is showing just how the potassium uh, vanishes from from the plant tissue potassium is fairly mobile and it, therefore uh, uh, when the, the, the old tissues the, the tissues become old the concentration of potassium in these old tissues will decrease will be mobilized to other uh, young leaves and uh, fruits um, and in the plant uh, residues also there is a, a steady decline and supply for the next crop if you keep the plant residues on the farms that will be a good source of potassium also for the next crops uh, here is showing that the potassium uh, uh, uptake by plants is usually uh, very strong on the early stages of the plant growth. The, 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 if you supply potassium as a starter, which is usually what's recommended, uh, then you, the plant will uh, uptake all the potassium it needs and then will reuse and redistribute that to, uh, throughout the season on the plant tissues and you don't have to worry too much because the, the, the potassium that is uptaken can be easily redistributed and will be uh, enough for the full cycle of the crop. Whereas for nitrogen and phosphorus, there's a more steady uptake and a need of constant uh, uh, amount and availability on the soil solution. Potassium can be uh, easily, uh, if you have a high concentration on the start of the crop, that is enough for supplying for the full cycle. Uh, you can have the same type of uh, uh, dose response of fertilizer recommendation that you see for nitrogen and phosphorus until you have the sufficiency levels that is uh, usually over 100 ppm on the pot uh, uh, the soluble potassium in the soils yeah uh, regarding the 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 application uh, of potassium and timing um, you should try to uh, use uh, bend applications and near the, the root zone to maximize the efficiency of the potassium fertilizer uh, always use it as a starter uh, it's uh, but consider also that uh, when you want to really see the response of the plants this effect of potassium is much less evident than it is the effect of nitrogen and phosphorus the plant response when you're nitrogen deficient or phosphorus deficient and you apply nitrogen and phosphorus is very very visible in the case of potassium is usually less so uh, 
So you should not be concerned. Uh, just uh, when you uh, do your fertilizer application with nitrogen and potassium, uh, use a formula that also contains uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. You, uh, use a formula that also contains some amount of potassium, and usually that will be enough. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when you do it uh, 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 bonded K, you should do it below the sea level uh, to maximize the uh, optimize the, the plant uptake of this potassium. Um, when you have soils with strong capacity to retain uh, uh, phosph uh, uh, pot uh, potassium, you should always try to do the band application yeah, near the root zone. Uh, the timing normally does not have any impact on potassium use for crops. So uh, ideally you do it in the start of the crops and that will make uh, that you will have uh, no issues with potassium uh, uh, whatsoever. The, the main issue of potassium, of course, is when is not when you have deficiency, because if you are if you have a fertilizer uh, program, you you use usually will have sufficiency of potassium. Uh, uh, the main issue for uh, for potassium is the excess of potassium. And this is uh, uh, more and more important when you have uh, you're using your crop residues for dairy farms. So when you have excess potassium on the plant tissues, you can cause milk fever to the cows. So it's very important to test your soils and make sure you don't have excessive potassium concentration on your soils. And if you do have, you need to uh, 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 consider a, a depletion program to have uh, 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 to to in, to find a way to decrease your potassium levels to acceptable ranges. Yeah, uh, the, one of the things you can do in these situations when you have excess potassium on the soils is to delay how, the time you cut your your plants. You will have less proteins, but also you will have less potassium. Yeah, you will increase the fiber content, but the potassium will be mobilized and then you will have less potassium on the on on the plant material all in all uh to wrap up my, the the fertilizer recommendation strategy you should think uh base your fertilizer recommendation not in potassium base your fertilizer recommendation uh, in phosphorus and nitrogen it's very hard to balance three nutrients on the fertilizer formula so if you have deficiency, consider a formula that contains potassium and that will be enough, uh, but base your fertilizer recommendation mainly on phosphorus and nitrogen, which are the most problematic uh, nutrients for the plant nutrition, the management of plant nutrition on farms. And if you are buying organic fertilizer, for sure you will have enough potassium for the, the plant growth. Yeah? The, always take care the, to avoid the excessive buildup of potassium is especially when you're trying to use these crops for uh, animal feeds uh, and uh, you should attract uh, one of the things that uh, that is very important is you lose a lot of potassium by leaching when you have sandy soils like in Oman so if you uh, have uh, a lot of rainfall in some time of the year try to avoid using the potassium in that time so uh, you would you would expect in the case of Oman that because you have uh, sandy soils and usually they are irrigated a good amount of this potassium will be going out on the leachate yeah on the, the, the leaching waters so this is all I have to bring to you about potassium today uh, uh, not as complex as it is for phosphorus and nitrogen um, you shouldn't be too worried about potassium but uh, keep in mind that uh, you, you, you might have deficiency and you have to consider it as part of, of your fertilizer application program. And if you have excess buildup of potassium, you should be wary about uh, not using this for uh, uh, animal feed. And if you, if you are, you have to think about a program of decreasing the potassium concentration in plant tissues because the plants will usually accumulate more potassium than they need when there is an excessive concentration in soils all right thank you that was all for today see you in the next lecture